and then I'm going to back. Hi, everyone. This is Mihaela with Hey Stella. Hi, everyone. This is Mihaela with Hey Stella Podcast. I have decided to do this episode on the most event of the week, which has to do with a trial between the great actor Johnny Depp and actress ex-wife Amber Heard. I know unless you live under a rock that everybody is aware of it. I'm sure everybody's watching it as much as I am watching it. I've become addicted to it. But the reason why I've become addicted to it is not because I am here to place judgment on victims that have been physical, verbal, psychological, emotional, and all other ways of being abused. I know what that is. I will get into it maybe later on, but I've had some deals with some of the verbal sexual abuse in my life. For those victims out there who have experienced any sort of abuse, it is horrible. It is horrific. You should speak out. You should have the courage to speak out. This is not what the episode is about. The episode is about my understanding as an acting coach and trying to analyze what I have seen so far, specific analysis of the behavior of Johnny Depp, specific analysis of the behavior of Amber Heard in court so far. So the title of the episode is going to be Emotional Manipulation. So many of the public, because they don't have anywhere to understand it better, believe that if they see an actor or an actress, sometimes I'm gonna refer to an actor for both feminine and masculine, public general audiences believe that if they see actors produce tears that are going to be in their eyes or if they're going to fall on their cheeks, they are speaking the truth. They are being real with their emotion because they can produce tears. And I'm here to say that's not necessarily the case. Having watched the trial, I was probably so addicted to it because there are so many different expressions that I could learn from, from the point of view of the acting coach, from the point of view of the teacher of acting. So, because the episode doesn't allow for analysis to be for hours and hours and hours, and I don't want to bore you with it. I'm going to start with Johnny Depp first, and then I'll go to Amber Heard. So Johnny Depp, whenever he was on the stand, and I'm talking about the moments that I was able to watch, and he talks about his side of the story of the events that happened between the two of them, I could not help but notice that he has a tick, he has a mannerism where almost every end of a phrase when describing that whatever he's talking about, trying to recreate the relationship between him and Amber, he has a mannerism where he smiles He'll talk about, this is what happened between me and Amber, and I am a person who wants to stay away from conflict, which he says, allegedly, she was the one that started all the time. And as soon as he finishes doing it, that phrase, he has a smile. He has a smile. There's like nervous smile. And I'm looking at it and I'm wondering again, trying to analyze his behavior, psychology transformed into behavior. Behavior is the definition of Ilya Kazan as I talk about it all the time in the podcast. 
I'm trying to analyze that behavior. And I'm trying to imagine him as being a character that I would have to work with. And let's just say that character happens to be on the stand and he's being asked questions by his lawyers and then he's cross-examined by the lawyers of Amber Heard. And what would I do if I were to rehearse that? And what would I say to him? I will first of all ask him if he's aware that whenever something of grave happening is being described at the end of it, almost because he's trying to make it seem less, he has a brief smile with the sound of a laughter behind it. I don't know if you guys noticed it, but if you're watching beginning next week when they're coming back from having a week off, I want you to pay attention to that. It's almost like a brief. <sighs> And he does it all the time. So if I were to work with somebody who was portraying that character, let's just say on the stand, I would ask the question, do you know that every time you finish a phrase or every time you finish discussing an event that happened, which was abusive, which was physical, he says he was the one that was being uh, abused by Amber. Do you know I would say, do you know, Johnny Depp, that you have this mannerism? And if you do, can you tell me what that's about? Because as actors, when we are doing a play or when we are doing a movie, if a mannerism is something that comes up all the time and it's being repeated, it means that there's something behind that. Either there's tension, which I'm sure there is tension because this is a trial and he's fighting for his reputation. He's fighting for his career. He's fighting for his livelihood. So I would probably ask him, do you know that that is something that you do? Because the mannerisms have to be taken in. They have to be observed. And then you have to become aware of when the next time it happens and see if you become aware of when it happens the next time, if you do not do it, if you just become aware of it. So if I'm sitting there and I'm asked the question and I talk about, so we were going to my island in the Bahamas and she got really upset, for example, and she took something and she threw it at my face. And my instinct, my mannerism, which has become such a part of my habitual behavior is going to come up I think about it, I stop it, and then I see what will be the substitution, what will be the feeling that will replace that mannerism. Usually when we have a mannerism and it's being repeated over and over again as actors and in life also, when stopped and being observed, something else will come up, some feeling will come up that the mannerism is keeping down. The mannerism is hiding. So I would just be curious to why he has that happening over and over and over and over again. I hope, I hope this makes sense. So just think about, do you have something that you do all the time? I do. For example, for me, I am very animated when I speak. I think it's because I'm trying to make sure that I'm doing a great job when I do the podcast or when I talk to people or when I teach class. So I feel like my animated self, sometimes when I decide that I want to hold it back to see what that covers, other emotions will come up that will surprise even me. I will be surprised by some other emotions that will come up when I don't release them through my animated physical being. That would be a question that I would have for him. I would probably also question why, and this is in both cases, does he get upset when he is being interrupted from him telling the story by the lawyers of Amber Heard. Whenever there is an interruption due to legal formalities, which I'm not going to get into because I'm not an expert in legal issues and I don't pretend to be one like other 
so many so-called experts pretend to be experts in acting and they have no idea what's going on. Why would I be so upset? Why are you so upset if you know you're telling the truth in your recalling of the events that took place during the period of the time that is being discussed? Is it because it makes you lose track of the pacing of the way that you want to tell the story? Do you have to make small jokes that he makes sometimes when that happens because you are showing the jurors, the audience in this case, and then all of us who happen to be watching are you trying to show them that you are a jokester? Are you trying to show us that you are a fun guy? Are you trying to make jokes so to let people that you will never do the aggravated physical abuses that he's being called to have done by his ex, Amber. (laughs) See, I did that. And then I'm looking at the other side of the court to her lawyers and I'm making tiny jokes about, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I wasn't ready to finish talking. So How can you say that this is uh, hearsay if you didn't even let me tell my story? Uh, What is this about? What is going on? Why is it that we complain when we know the rules of the court? So he knows the rules of the court and of the trial. Why is he not able to relax and to take a step back and let it flow? What is happening in the court when he's testifying? That's as far as I can think about him right now. That's taking me a little bit out of believing everything of what he's saying about the fact that he was not abusive towards her because those stand out. Those little things, those little details are what inform character, character in someone, in a human being, but also character when playing a character. When you go to Amber Heard, where she was testifying, what she seems to be doing, which is different than what Johnny Depp does, but it's pretty much similar because these are her habitual mannerisms that she's letting out. For example, she's working up to an emotion by making her breathing be very escalated so she's working herself up to produce an emotion which in the case of actors when working on characters we are not even allowed to go there because that will be called manufactured emotion so manufactured emotions for actors when playing characters are not taken in by the audience because the audience somewhere in their brain can identify them to be false. They can identify them to be fake. So if I'm sitting here, for example, and I want to continue telling you the rest of the episode in a way that I want you to have feelings of empathy towards me because I'm relating to you something that I went through. And let's just say the audience, in this case, the jurors in the courtroom are to my right, the way that the court is set up. And I keep looking at the audience. I'm playing to the audience while I'm working myself up, while I'm manipulating my emotion to be able to show them that what I'm saying is real. And that this, my side of the story, 
there's a vacuum outside. So do you see how I'm responsive to what's happening outside? And that takes me away from the manufactured emotion that I was trying to gather up. And I feel that she's doing that. I feel that she is focusing on her breathing to get her to the emotional result that she is attempting to create real truth that she believes in her storytelling and get empathy from the jurors, from the audience, in the court and on different social platforms. But when she's being stopped, the same way that Johnny Depp is being stopped, when she's being stopped by his lawyers, she loses that. She can stop it. So it's very untrue to me. If you are in an emotional experience due to recreation of a horrific event that happened at the hands or at the words of Johnny Depp, that emotional advancement, that emotional triggering as you are recreating it would not be stopped so easily in my case because there's somebody vacuuming the hallway but in her case because the lawyers of Johnny Depp are stopping due to again legal formulas that I don't know so if I'm working myself up to cry I'm actually doing the opposite of what I want to do. I'm giving myself obstacles that will completely stop the emotion that I am looking for to manufacture for the jurors to believe me that I'm telling the truth. Because if I'm working myself up, do you see how I'm getting tensed up? My body gets tensed up. If the breathing is not allowed, to be at a pace of average, relaxed, normal breathing, my instrument, the whole self, my mind, my body, everything that has to do with myself will be restricted from allowing the emotion to happen. So that's what I felt that she was doing. She was working so hard to create the emotion that she was actually stopping herself from having the emotion. So then she decided that she was going to go for it and go for it and go for it even more and even more and even more. And she was searching for, for, for outside elements. And, and, and she was trying to get there, but she couldn't, that, she couldn't get there. So that got her upset. Instead of herself leaving herself alone, if she would have known to just leave herself alone and tell the story in details without jumping from what she knew that it suits her to what it did not suit her, that would have been more believable for me, the audience watching. Because the way that she was doing it was so manufactured. The way that she was blowing her nose and she was moving her face in so many different ways, which creates all sort of tension in the muscles of the face. If you're creating all this sort of tension in the muscles of the face, the crying is not going to come out because you are going for the emotion. You have to stop going for the emotion. You have to put that off and you have to give yourself the opportunity to just sit and be as detailed as you can with the events and retelling of those events by using, engaging all of your senses in retelling them. If I'm sitting here and if I'm going to tell you an event from my life, which I haven't decided that I was going to do when this episode began, but I am going to attempt to do that. Even though my brain is telling me right now, don't even attempt doing it because you're not going to be able to demonstrate what the point is, which is 
to get to the result of the final result, which is I want to cry. So the audience sees me cry. Therefore, they're going to believe that I'm telling the truth because that's what comes with our brain being conditioned that we have to cry. But if I say I don't have to cry, this is not about telling something that at the end, I'm putting expectations on my shoulders, I'm putting expectations on my instrument for a final result. If I can tell my brain that I'm not going to put those expectations on myself and I'm just gonna leave myself alone and I'm going to recall an event from my life, engaging all my senses, I would choose an event of significance as these events that are being retold in court by Johnny Depp and by Amber Heard and by all the other people who are being called as witnesses are of significance because if they were not of significance, they would not be here. This would not happen. So if I were to choose an event from my life, let me take a moment to see what event that would be. Again, more people, I hear voices that distracts me. I have to admit to myself that I'm being distracted because if I don't, and if I keep going with wanting to finish what I have started to say without allowing myself the truth of what is happening in the moment, which is I'm being distracted because I'm thinking of all the times that they can do the vacuuming outside and the talking. Why does it have to be now when I'm actually doing the podcast? So it's getting me a little bit upset. Let that in. Let that be part of how I continue to do the episode. Event from my life. Now I feel so... I feel a little bit annoyed because I feel like nothing's coming to me and I feel like I want to make you guys understand of that, what I was talking about and I'm feeling frustrated with myself. So again, our mind is so much more conditioned to go to punishing, to go to being negative to, to what we are, to who we are because it's so much easier to go to the negative than it is to go to the positive. So let me see if I can take back those mannerisms that I have, which I talked about before. And if I don't use my hands as I do all the time in the way that I'm explaining and I'm moving and I'm doing things, what if I just sit? So I'm sitting, which is really hard for me to do because I feel that I have to be engaging. So by sitting and not doing all of the animated expressions, it's almost like I don't feel that I am worthy. I don't feel like I'm enough to keep you interested. So that's a lot for us to take on to say, you know what, it doesn't matter. Forget about trying to please the audience. Forget about thinking that the audience is expecting of you to be animated. So if I'm just sitting and I'm going to describe to you an event from my life of significance, similar to this episode, what can I go to? I remember that when I first came to New York, I was in my late 20s. I was so sure in my youth and being so naive, I had so much believe that I was going to come here and I was going to be a movie star. I was going to make it as a movie star. I was going to somehow, I didn't have a plan. Somebody at some point was going to take me and they were going to make me a movie star in America. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me if I had any kind of detailed way of going about it, but I just for sure knew that that's what I was going to do. I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else than being an actress. But when I arrived in New York, I realized very early on that living here cost a lot of money and I had to get a job. That would have been my first job outside of being an actress. As you know, I lived in Romania before. Out of uh, college, I was working in some of the theaters in Romania. I wasn't a famous actress, no, not at all, but I started to work on a few shows with very known actors whom I had so much to learn from. So I thought that the same thing was going to continue when I arrived here. And then once I did, that wasn't the case. 
I realized that I had to get a job, like a job outside of being an actress, which I had never had a job before. I had a job when I was in Detroit in high school and I was working for friends of my father in a gas station, but that was only a part-time job. It wasn't like I needed to make money. It wasn't like a matter of survival. Do you see how I go back to my animated hands and I'm trying to stay away from it? So one thing that you can do is you can sit on them. You can sit on your hands, which is what I'm doing right now. So I don't have to be concerned so much about them. But that is such a mannerism. That is such a habitual comportment on my part where I'm so animated and I use my hands. So coming to New York, I had to get a job. I had a friend that I had met here. He was this Romanian guy who had been here. He had arrived before me and I got to meet him due to the place that we were all living at. And he said to me, you know, I know this Romanian lady who has a company that will help you find a job. I wasn't sure what the job was going to be. And then I went to see her with him, I believe, and she told me that there was an opening position to work in a restaurant. Having never worked in a restaurant before, I used to be the customer, I used to be the client going to restaurants in Romania all the time, but I never worked in a restaurant and I remember I had to I had to uh, lie to them. So I was naming restaurants from Romania when I put in my resume saying that I was working in a restaurant, but I just named restaurants from Romania that I used to go to all the time. During the next years, I got the job. During the next years, there was a lot of, there was a lot of things that were happening within that restaurant that felt like they were not right. But at that time, I was so afraid having just come to New York and having been so scared of everything that I couldn't yet distinguish between those wrong things happening and me doing something wrong. I wasn't able to understand that people in more powerful positions than you are in should behave in a way that is respectful and decent and with integrity, no matter that you are in a less position than they are. I was so grateful and I was so thankful that I was making money to be able to live here and continue my studies at the Actor Studio MFA program that I allowed everything that was coming my way to be, in my mind, what I thought was normal behavior of what people who are your bosses do. There were so many during the many years that I worked at the restaurant, but if I were to choose one of the events that are now becoming a little bit more clear and one of them is coming up out of the other ones would be I would get up and I would take really good care of myself physically to look really beautiful that was so important to me that I looked really beautiful and skinny I remember they used to call me flaquita, which in Spanish is skinny, flaquita. But every time I went to this particular place, I had this feeling of not being sufficient because of the behavior that was coming to me was always making me feel that I should be grateful for having that job as if to say I did not deserve it because I hadn't had any experience before of working in a restaurant. Right now, mm, this is harder than I thought it was going to be because I don't want to go into details. And it's so strange that what I had planned to do has now taken me back 
to something else in my life which happened many, many years before my arrival in New York. I don't want to go there. I'm not ready to go there. So I feel disappointed in myself right now because I was promising you that I was going to give you a specific event and I don't want to go there because I'm not ready for it. I'm just going to recreate sensorially because I want to make a point. I'm just going to recreate a event without giving details to see what that will do. So at the same time that I'm actually doing this live, I'm actually experimenting and I have no idea what's going to happen. And I have no idea where I'm going to go to. But this other event that I did not think about came to mind. I will say that I was driving somewhere in Romania. I can say that. Driving, looking outside the car, evening, the smell of the air was really salty. It was somewhere by the Black Sea. It was really beautiful. Summertime, everything was cool. We were driving to go to a different place from where I was staying. Dark outside, getting darker. It seemed all of a sudden that the place was the distance between the place where I was and the place that we were gonna go got to be longer than I would have expected. And realized that I was misinformed about the destination. And there was a different location that we went to than the one that I was expecting and the one that I was told we were gonna go to. All of a sudden, this fear just overtook me. Fear of understanding that I was misled to where we were going to go and what was going to happen next. And I didn't have anybody else with me except for the person that was driving the car. <sighs> The fact that I'm having such a hard time just showed me something which I wasn't even expecting out of this episode. It showed me that it's not so easy to talk about something that was horrific, which is the opposite of what Amber was doing. So if she was having such an horrible, and I'm not saying that she wasn't, this is not about placing judgment on one or the other, but if her experiences of what she was trying to recreate were so horrific, I now see how going to such an event is much more difficult knowing that you're being watched and knowing that you are being revealing some private, shameful things that you feel sh ashamed of, no matter that you don't have to, but you do feel ashamed of, it takes more time to allow yourself to expose those to audiences. And this is the lesson that I have for the day. Yeah, it's, do you feel that my speech, even the pattern and my rhythm in my speech changed and the um, animated self that I was before trying to recall this event that just came up, not even thinking that I was going to go there, that mellowed me down. It made me speak less fast. It gives me that opportunity to not have to 
speak to engage you. It's almost like the event becomes so much more significant because of the pain that it involved emotional pain, psychological pain, verbal pain, physical pain, that it doesn't even matter anymore if you are conveying it to the audience. It's almost like you give up on that objective that you had to begin with, which is I want to make the audience believe me that I'm telling the truth. I want the audience to know that I'm actually revealing my truth to them. That becomes not as important because the event is so much more stronger inside of you and you're actually feeling it. So the audience and the importance of playing to the audience is less important. With Amber, she was so stuck on the audience the whole time that she was trying to present her case and to present her side of the story. It was almost as if, if I'm looking at you right now and I'm looking at the audience and I'm saying, this is what happened to me. This is what happened to me. I was in this situation. But if I'm looking at you and I'm not taking you in, I'm not taking you in. Like right now, I'm taking you in. I'm taking you in to look who's watching. Hi, everyone who's watching. I'm taking you guys in. That will change the comportment. That will change the expression on my face, as you can see right now. But she was taking the audience in and she was staying within the same general looking towards them. I'm going to tell you what happened to me. This is what happened. But I can't remember this other side. But then I remember this part and then I was on the floor, but then I was next to the couch and then I felt this and my hair was being pulled from right to left and I was, I was, I was facing the floor, but then I wasn't facing the floor. There's so much intensity in the way that she was revealing it, that if an actor were to do that when playing a role, we would ask that actor to take a little breath try to relax and continue because it's not good for the actor to allow themselves to be in that hyper ventilating breathing it's not good because you can't continue on like that for a long time that's going to take so much out of you that it's going to make you stop later on from continuing the rest of the story that you have to tell so to be able to keep in mind the audience that you're playing to so much and to just look at them 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 and try to try to to get yourself to that point of where you think in your mind that you have to portray a certain way of expression for them to believe you is what feels manufactured right now what happened was that I had no emotion when I was trying to tap into that event from my life. There was no emotion. So to say that people behave the same to pain and to suffering and to abuse, that's just something that is a general outcome. You can never say that people will have the same reaction to something as others. We all have different reactions depending on the day, depending on the moment, depending on so many other elements. So to be taken to this pacing where now I feel that it's really hard for me to get out of, which is one where I've calmed down as the memory is still very fresh. I feel goosebumps down my spine. Yeah. But um, what else do I want to talk about? Oh my God, I feel like this was all over the place. And I always try to work on something that's really difficult for me, which is trying to stay a little bit structured. But at the same time, I don't want to be mean to myself. I don't want to like, you know, say that I wasn't, good at doing this episode I guess the outcome of it and I guess from where it started when I started talking about this and to where my expectations were 
that it was going to end are completely different. And I feel that the expectations are still part of me because expectations are part of all of us. And that's the hardest thing for any of us to get rid of. And that's what keeps us dissatisfied when we shouldn't be dissatisfied because no matter what the episode is going to end up to be, I still did it. I have to look at the positive and I have to say, you know what? You didn't have to do this this morning, this afternoon, this noon day, but I am committed to doing it because as I say all the time, if you can only help one person with an acting tip for acting or an acting tip for life, that's sufficient. So I am very proud of myself for doing that. Speaking that out is needed because as I keep saying all the time, the conditioning is that the mind doesn't need as much work to go to us saying negative things about us. So when we want to say positive things or when we want to have positive feelings about ourselves, we have to work harder and we have to speak them out and say them sometimes. I feel so bad about watching what's happening with these two people. I think we all have the impression that once you get to a point in life as they did, Johnny Depp becoming the successful great actor of this generation, Amber, rising star. When you see two people like that, who in our minds, looking from the outside, we think they have everything that they wanted to achieve on their own personally and career-wise, and then they come together. That's the fairy tale that we all dream of, the fairy tale of finding the love of our lives, the fairy tale of being satisfied with our careers, with our with ourselves. We still believe in those those kept visions that we see from the outside of other people. So when those are being dissected and when we come to the realization that human beings, no matter the career success, no matter the personal success, we remain humans with qualities, with flaws, with everything in between. So it's almost as if we don't have anything to strive for. Because if we're looking at these two people, we're looking at Johnny Depp and we're looking at at Amber and we're saying they could not make it, they could not be happy with all that we feel that they have, we can only dream of, and they're not happy, then what are we to strive for? And I think the fact that What's happening in the world right now with the Ukrainian war, which is catastrophic, what's happening with the pandemic, still they're talking about another wave happening in the fall. I think we're so much more slapped to reality and to the fact that we are mortals and we should be living the same way that actors are being asked to live, which is moment to moment in the present, appreciating everything that we have because there's no guaranteed next moment. It's almost actors lesson to people's lives and vice versa. Art imitates life, life imitates art. And I think more than ever now, those two are so face to face because of the uncertainty that was always there as humans. The only certainty that we have that we are mortals, but the uncertainty was always there, but it was never so visible as it is now. Yeah, I think the actor's training is so much more relevant nowadays than it was ever before and uh, like I said watching these two people behave watching their private lives and private moments talk about private moments of the actors but private moments of these two people being exposed is something that is a reminder to all of us that we are all the same, pretty much. It doesn't matter of the successful careers or personal successes. So we should try to stay kind. We should try to stay in the moment and appreciate the present. Yeah, that's all I have to say for today. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for listening. Hey, Stella Podcast.